Hi, this is Jeff Berlin, and you are watching Sonic Perspectives. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another interview of Sonic Perspectives. I'm Rodrigo, and my guest today is simply one of the best bass players of all time, Mr. Jeff Berlin. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Rodrigo. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I love talking about music, so I'm glad to be here. Yeah, that's what we're here for, of course. And, uh, well, I'd like to cover as much of your career as possible today, but First of all, let's talk about your most recent album, Jack Songs, an homage to Jack Bruce, right? Yes, Jack is pretty much the central figure uh, that made me the bass player that I am. Um, when I heard him as a young man, uh, I was 14, I heard Wheels of Fire, which was one of the great Cream records, and the mm -hmm. two live cuts, Crossroads and Spoonful, simply changed my life. His bass playing on that was utterly original still is to this minute he uh utilized i would say jazz harmony the concept of improvisation and he did it uh in in our kind of contemporary loud rock manner i know ginger baker didn't like referring to himself or the band as a rock band <laughs> but it did have sort of the elements of rock which is power and uh pretty much a non-swing approach so jack really was the central figure in my life and even to today i mean last night i listened to the old crossroads uh was blown away again there was something about that trio and utterly something about jack bruce that changed me and i that's why i did my record jack songs to honor him because he he influenced me so much yeah and i think to me it's amazing uh, how eight years after he passed away he's still relevant to this day right I believe he is. Everyone all over the world knows Jack Bruce. I mean, yeah. everybody all over the world knows dun 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 dun. I mean, there isn't a a continent or a or a country or a town that doesn't have people that don't know his music. Um, yeah. He's relevant and uh, easily one of the great musicians. One of the one of the great ones that sadly left us too soon. Yeah, I can tell you a story. My daughter is eight years old now, and she plays that song that you just mentioned, Sunshine of Your Love, on piano. Sure. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, Jack had something remarkable. I, I, yeah. I'll never get tired of sharing that. Yeah. And I know the, the initial idea for the project came up in 2015, uh, and you were only re able to release it now. It was still an incredible sense of accomplishment right now, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, You know, I'm not, I, I'm glad to actually about this, but I, I'm not the first musician to, let's say, either take a long time to realize a project uh, or even uh, some bands have recorded whole records, uh, then ditched them and began again. I yeah. mean, it, it's not a complete unknown thing. So, um, Jack, I'm an artist that basically has always functioned and always supported my career more or less on my own terms. I have a booking agent, I have an agent, but it's always sort of been my terms. And, and I understand it. I've never achieved, let's say, superstardom like a lot of people have. And I'm okay with it because it's the music that I chose. It's the path that I chose. So in that sort of sense of dedication to my instrument and to a certain credo of music, It never quite fit the broad terms of uh, popularity. Jack Bruce, neither outside of Cream, ever achieved what he achieved while he was in Cream. Yeah. Um, the reason I mention that is because Jack's songs and everything that p pertains to it is entirely was entirely my doing. Uh, that and my uh, my business partner, my friend and producer of Jack's songs, John McCracken. It was a two man operation. I did all the music. He did the production and. We shouldered the whole project and I financed the whole project because it was urgently needed for me mm -hmm. to release a record that was simply not going to have an equal, I felt, when it finally came out. It was meant to be special. It was meant to blow people away. So um, I uh, took a long time to realize this. 
but I didn't have the benefits of a record company or a, or a power system behind me to help. So everything I've right. achieved, I achieved on my own uh, efforts. Right, of course, yeah. And some of the songs here on the album are covers, theme from an imaginary Western and Rope Ladder to the Moon, but others are original songs you wrote with snippets and ideas of Jack Bruce songs, right? Uh, interestingly, I don't think there's a cover on the record. So if you'll forgive me, I will sort of share that. Okay. Uh, covering songs, uh, Jack's songs have been covered. Everyone covered theme. Who's a fan of Jack's who covered theme? Uh, all the Cream songs have been covered. So what I decided to do was not cover them, but change them, arrange them, make them into an amalgamation of something unique. Right. Uh, because how do you choose songs from a, from a lifetime's worth of repertoire? So it all came from uh, an inspiration. The record uh, was inspired by Giles Martin. Giles Martin is the son of George Martin. And Giles produced a record for Cirque du Soleil called uh, The Beatles Love. And when I heard it, what he did is, is that he extracted several Beatle quotes, songs, and put them into one tune. So it passed from this song to that song to this quote to that quote. And they were all in time. And they were all in the same key. And they all sounded organically perfect. I don't know how he did it, but <laughs> it was so brilliant what Giles Martin did that I thought I could do something similar, but I couldn't extract actual written, excuse me, recorded uh, music. So I had to arrange it. So the very first tune, for example, is Creamed with a yeah. D at the end. I wrote that to combine six or seven Cream songs, because it's all based in the blues. So the harmony wasn't uh, different from each other. So where I uh, corrected uh, your thought or or was about the covers is that I didn't do any covers. Okay. I did, I did more arrangements. And the because I, everybody's covered these songs, I couldn't make it interesting if I did dun 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 bang dun bang bang dun, dun, you know. Yeah. And I, I felt the arrangements was going to be more exciting to people. Fair enough. And I love what you did at Cream. You have uh, I Feel Free, Sunshine of Your Love, Born Under a Bad Sign. I, I recognize those, those three right off the bat, but there's five or six, you, right? Yeah. yeah, there's five or six Cream songs in one arrangement. Yeah. And what made it special is that there's a, like a, a, you know, there's a million of us Cream fans in the world. And the interesting thing is that nobody will have ever heard Cream presented in I Feel in the way that I presented it here. That's the yeah. idea of the Jack songs, to take the spirit of Jack, which was creative and unique, and I took his music to try to make it creative and unique. It was his inspiration that got me to do that. Yeah, and you got Alex Lysson to, to play a solo on that song, which is, you know, beautiful. And he's a fan of, of Cream as well, I know for a fact. So, yeah, good choice. <laughs> well, I, I, the Rush guys are lovely people i think our our relationship is based in our mutual friendship as as people coincidentally they're amongst the greatest players on their instruments that there yeah. are and and both getty and alex lent their playing to the record they're fans of jacks and they're both friends of mine and yeah. that's what led itself to the guest list that i that i have and then and, yeah. and how the record turned out that's all yeah. Yeah, there's a story about you jamming with the with the Rush guys as a quartet because you took bass and Getty went to the keyboards. What did you guys play? <laughs> oh, if I recall, I think we pl I don't know. I think we played G. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good enough. I okay. believe we just sort of happened on a chord. I was standing off to the side because when mm -hmm. they came into town, I, I'd go and see them. So I'm there and a guy grabs my arm, pulls me on stage and gives me Getty's bass. Getty went to keyboards and we jammed for a while and it was fun. Awesome. I'd like yeah. to be a fly on the wall in that uh, in that jam because I love Rush. I'm in Canada, by the way. So, yeah. Ah, well, <laughs> then there you are. You, all you have to do is go out the door, make a right turn and you'll find them. Yes. <laughs> if, if, if only it was that easy, but OK. <laughs> if only it was that easy. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, I love a uh, theme from an imaginary Western. What was the process to kind of revamp that one and reimagine that song? Well, for me, a theme from an imaginary Western is Jack's most famous song outside of Cream. It might be the 
uh, uh, stand standalone tune he did as a solo artist. At least that's how mm -hmm. I see it. So again, how do I just do what he did and what uh, Mountain did with Felix Papillardi and Leslie West or what some other band did? I changed it. I wrote slight little sections. I composed sections to join this with this, but mm -hmm. in a way that nobody has heard. I love that it's new. That's special for me. I like to do that. Make surprise, you know, for everybody. Yeah. And then I changed keys. And then I was fortunate to get Eric Johnson to play oh, guitar. Amazing, yeah. Amazing. And then I had to follow it with a bass tone, a presentation that was original as well. Something where it was uh, distorted but round. It was a. It's a John McCracken innovation. Uh, he really helped to create my tone. And right. I would be there and say, well, can be this, can be that. But he did it. So. That was what theme was. Theme had to be for me. Theme is the song Paul McCartney knows, the song that uh, Ringo Starr knows, the song that uh, 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 Dave Grohl. Yeah. Dave, Dave Grohl knows the song that anybody that is a fan of Jack knows. Wouldn't know. A yeah. lot of people might not know Into the Storm. They might not know He the Richmond, you know? So. Yeah. Theme had to be special. Right. And it turned out great, for sure. Yeah. And, I love it. Yeah. And Rope Ladder to the Moon is another mm -hmm. one of Jack's solo songs. You have Bumblefoot doing a solo there. I, I think a lot of people know him from the Guns N' Roses times, but don't realize how accomplished this guy is, right? Uh, Ron Bumblefoot Thal is one of the greatest guitarists I ever played with. When, when we met at the NAM show, at a NAM show, we sat down, I had a bass, he grabbed the guitar, and without rehearsal, we played the second side of Abbey Road. Wow. We yeah. just jammed and we remembered this and we just da da ba da 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 you know, and all those things because we'd listened to music for so long. And this was my first personal inkling into what a brilliant guy Ron is. Plus, he's one of the nicest people it, you can ever meet in music so yeah. having him on there to be honest i think he did one of the most spectacular solos on the record because ron plays vertically in part mm -hmm. vertically instead of horizontally here's horizontally here's vertically intervallically Ron Duck did that on Rope Ladder and blew my gosh darn mind from it. This <laughs> was a brilliant rendition. Yeah. No, oh, it's amazing, yeah. Guitar rendition, guitar yeah. rendition. Oh, my goodness, did he smoke it? <laughs> yeah, I saw one of his uh, storytelling shows, and he plays for like hours, two, three hours, playing so many covers. And I'm like, this guy must have, I, I don't know, 500 songs on his his mind, his mind, just he can just dust it off immediately and play it to the note, right? Covers and his own songs. Yeah. He's just incredible. Yeah, I agree. I yeah. agree. Yeah. And tell me about Sammy Hager. Uh, that's a curious choice for me because he's more on the hard rock side of things, right? He's not a jazz guy by any means or a fusion guy. Well, my hope was to not make a jazz record for sure mm. and not make a fusion record. <laughs> I wanted this to be a rock record. Dun, 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 dun. You know, uh -huh. I wanted this to be loud and powerful. And to be honest, Sammy has one of the great melodic rock voices. If you listen to a lot of Sammy singing, he sings pitch. He does. Yeah. He has attitude in it. You know, that yeah. wonderful instrument that he has. And uh, we met many years ago, and just for a few moments, actually. I swear, it was that quick. And for some reason, I recalled it because he wasn't, let's say, famous at the time that he became after he joined Van Halen mm. in that kind of fame level. And I had just begun my, let's say, developing of a, of a reputation. So for some reason, he remembered meeting me, and I remember meeting him. So when <laughs> I managed to ask him, the thing about this record, Jack Songs, is everybody on it is a fan of Jack's. Sammy loved right. Jack, loved Cream. We all grew up listening to that band. So Sammy lent his vocal there because I really needed on, it's a Lan, La Angelo Misterioso. That, mm. that, that, 
I needed that. Um, I needed a great vocalist. A another thing about Sammy is, is when you get to his height of fame, and the established uh, 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 reputation that he has, that Alex Lifeson has, that Getty Lee has, and they still contribute to something different. It really says to me that these are people interested in music and art. Because yeah. when you've achieved that level, what else is left in your life except to do your thing or possibly other interesting things, which is what I love. I love it when they call me and say, you know, play a whole note. Sure. I mean, I'm happy to do it. Play, yeah. you know, this. Sure. The variety of music is interesting. I, I am for it. And that's what these guys did. Oh, yeah. by the way, the only cream jam is is on uh, is on uh, uh, L'Angelo Mysterioso. The only cream jam, the only real trio was Scott Henderson, Gary Husband and me. And it was after Sammy had finished singing. So, yeah, oh, it's okay. It's a pretty gutsy track. Sorry, I'm yeah. bragging here. But no, but it is. It. Yeah. So forgive me. Yeah. Uh, and one of my favorite moments is actually the bass relay on Smile Story and Morning Grins, where we can hear giants like Tony Levin, Getty Lee, Ron Carter, Nathan East, Marcus Miller, Billy Sheehan, and yourself. And did I forget? No, you? I'm not on it. <laughs> oh, you're not on that one. Okay. <laughs> no, um, the bass relay was meant to feature great bass players playing the bass line of a great bassist. Um, I uh, I removed myself from it, but actually arranged the part. Okay. So what it is, is, let me see, who is it? It's Tony Levin, Billy Sheehan, Michael League from Snarky Puppy, uh, Mark King from Level 42, followed by by then Ron Carter, who played upright, because I had to represent the upright instrument for a right. moment. Uh, Marcus Miller, you said, Nathan Neese from Clapton, and yeah. Getty Lee. And what it was is there's a bass line by Jack uh, in Smiles and Grins that goes da ba da ba da ba da 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 do da 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 do da 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 do da So I asked each guy to play that line four times and then solo four bars. So each guy did their little sequence. What I did is changed. I, you know, you can't do eight bars in the key of D minor. It'll it'll get redundant. So I then went to F and then G and then. So everybody was raising up a little bit in the harmony, and I did some stuff underneath them. But uh, I didn't play on it so that these guys might shine. Okay, that's what a producer does. So you have you co-produced that track, right? Ah, in a little bit of a way. I have to say, quite honestly, the true production of this is John McCracken. I mean, I had a hand in it. It's my music. But the result, yeah. the sonic result, the sonic finish, the mix, the whole element of this record is entirely the brilliance of John McCracken, who is playing guitar in my Jack uh, Bruce touring band next year, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. Do you intend to reproduce that live at some point? Well, as close to it as we can, I can't have real horns and I can't have a, you know, I, there were some chorus parts I wrote that were like nine or 12 voices. I mean, okay. double, triple, quadruple. Yeah. Um, so I wrote some parts for that, but there's no way I can duplicate that. So I have to either use uh, loops, which I've never done, but I'm mm -hmm. learning. Even, even as I get older, I'm still learning. I like that. <laughs> And so I might do that, but I have to arrange the music to be a little leaner and still as punchy. So I'm uh, going to reproduce as best as I can this record uh, that might be feasible for a live performance. Right. Okay. You know? Yeah. 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 And I know he started as a violin player and eventually moved to bass. Uh, what motivated that change? And did your learnings on the violin influence your bass playing in any way? My violin playing influenced my bass playing 100%. Um, uh, I played violin for 10 years. I was a regional Long Island, New York symphony violinist. I played, of course, in the school symphonies, and there were little festival symphony groups and stuff I auditioned right. for, and I got in. You know, I was considered fifth best in New York at my age at that time. I, you know, I was a seriously good little kid on violin. What happened was, is the Beatles came along <laughs> and they uh, permanently 
changed me. As Jack changed me in bass, the Beatles changed me in musical interest. Um, McCartney was always influential on me, but Jack was the one that galvanized me. So um, I went from that to uh, from violin. I finally gave it up, went to bass. And what it introduced to me was an understanding uh, about how to learn, how to be taught, and how to approach the instrument that might be slightly different than the way other people do it. I would say the first proponent of melodic bass was Jaco Pastorius because of his fretless sound, and he was perfectly in tune with it. He might be one of the very, very few basses playing fretless that I've heard that is perfectly in tune. Um, but the violin, and if I may, my violin and gave me a perspective of the bass education rhetoric that I have shared before, some of which isn't very popular. <laughs> yeah, I heard you about know, the controversy. Yeah, yeah. The controversy, I, I don't know if, if this fits the, the, uh, the paradigm of this discussion, but should I explain a little? Of course, of course. I, I, I had, I've always viewed base education as a product. What it means is, uh, here's money, teach me how to play. Here's money, make me a meal. Here's money, give me a functional automobile. Here's money, uh, uh, make me uh, uh, an edible and well-prepared meal. Yeah. What happened in base education, in my opinion, is that once teachers veered away from making music itself first, because a lot of teachers don't see it that way and have said so, have said that uh, music is not first. And while they're entitled to that, and while people are entitled to, to follow the principles of these teachers, my open statement where I named names, I, I did in the past, um, the, the teachers that don't teach music and teach style, style is self-taught, in fact, even the teachers that teach style to base students are self-taught in it. Mm. So there isn't a, a, a precedence in base education where learning how to be taught, taught how to play rock or blues or funk or metal, metal bass lines or groove. Groove is the end of base education because it states performance. It doesn't state learning how to play, thus becoming a good performer. So I'm absolutely certain that base educators have things backwards. And unfortunately, the people that love them don't understand this. See, what I try to do, I um, may I go on or is this too yeah, much? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Um, Jack was written in part, in part, for a lot of the people that were not pleased with me when I criticized the teaching of, let's say, Steve Bailey, or Berkeley or Victor Wooten, people were very upset about the fact that I might say these things and looked at me as a guy who just talked without having the ability to back it up. And I thought to myself, they're right. <laughs> they make very good sense. If they don't know what I do, then of course they're just going to think I'm being cruel or rude or jealous they've accused me of or whatever. So I said, I have to make this record to be so spectacular that perhaps the people that I'm looking out for, these are the people that uh, are upset with my views, ironically, are the people that I'm the most concerned about because I think they need somebody to at least give them the perspective that they ought to be taught better than I believe that they are. So even in the face of criticism and disagreement and great upset, I forged forward and said, this is not going to get you to play better. I said, your art is your choice. You can love your teachers. You can love your the, the players that they are. And mm -hmm. one should. I love lots of players. But I also wanted bass players to love their own musical lives and their own interest in music their own musical lives and their own instrument more than they love the teachers that teach them and i don't think they do when somebody <laughs> loves a teacher more than they love themselves in regards to bass <clears throat> they're not 
going to be thinking about the proper way to be taught. That's my opinion. Right. Well, now we have evidence of your rationale. So that's uh, finally something to show for and to back up your vision. Right. So, yeah, I think so. Did I talk too much about no. that? I hope I didn't. Of course not. No, no, that's fine. I wanted to share a thought. I don't mean insult. I don't mean harm. But I really feel that people ought to be told something that might be beneficial to them that they may not yeah. realize. Then yeah. they can decide. Then they can all decide. Yeah, yeah. You know, so and there's my thinking. There's my logic. Yeah, and you mentioned Berkeley. I mean, uh, how did that shape your development as a musician? Because I know you went there, right? When I went to Berkeley at the time, it was a smaller school, and the entire focus was on the teaching of music. You want to hear something interesting? The things that I shared with you today in part, I learned them from teachers at Berkeley back in 1972, 73. I only went two semesters, but I worked okay. very hard while I was there. Then I went out, I was playing. But it was these teachers that taught me that if we don't teach you music, because I was coming in playing like Jack, <laughs> they said, you don't need us for this. You need to be taught music. It's the only reason you're here. So I've had to, to kind of compare the philosophy of teaching at Berkeley back in 72 with what I believe the philosophy may be today. And it's greatly different and deviated, I feel again, from a pure 100% focus on the teaching of music. Forget about style, forget about career, forget about networking, forget about everything. If we don't know how to play, all that isn't going to make a difference. So that's why I've been very forward about it. I yeah. hope people understand and not be too offended by my views. Yeah, no, and I do agree. Yeah. And uh, I want to bring up another recent release that you did that you played on Derek Sherinian's album Vortex on the song called Seven Seas. Uh, how did that invitation come up? Now I played on who I, I didn't quite hear that Derek Sherinian's uh, oh I see Vortex. yeah oh um oh that's an interesting record um he wrote me would you play I said I would <laughs> like I said I like doing sideman things I created a bass part for the record he wrote back and said would you change it all and do this so everything you're hearing is is produced by him which is his right. So everything you're hearing represents his vision of music on his record. I was invited to play. And uh, I, I like being a sideman. I enjoy it. Um, I would say maybe little of what I did is there. But that's also functionally uh, uh, necessary. If I, I didn't actually produce anybody that played on the record. I just said, here's this part. Would you do your thing? Um, because these guys are so experienced in it. But had they might have deviated from what I needed, I might have asked them to do a certain thing. That's what Derek did, and I respect him for it. Got it. Got it. Understood. Uh, and I need to ask you about a different record that you played on. Uh, and this is a question from a friend of mine. Uh, the, the record is called Even Cowgirl Gets the Blues from mm -hmm. Katie Lang with Ben Mink. I interviewed Ben Mink uh, fairly recently, and, and he spoke about that album. So... <laughs> Um, Getty and Ben are dear friends. Right. Getty was uh, very generous in his his kind of effusing about me a little bit, I'd say. <laughs> Sweet man. I feel the same about him. And he said to Ben, go get Jeff. And he did. Called me up. I met Katie. So I've been in the studio. And I don't recall the session. I don't recall what I played. But I do recall being there. So, yes. Yeah, I've done a lot of sessions. I've done sessions where, I, to this day, I'm sworn to secrecy. How's that one? <laughs> I am. Really? <laughs> I've done things that a lot of people have heard and a lot of people know and are given credit to other people, but were not recorded by those people. Wow. And the reason that, it, and, and I'm being a little bit of a tease here, I will never share what those are, nor, nor is it important. But sometimes I was used for my skill in a certain manner, but was sworn to this. And I'm a man of my word. I always have been. If I, if I say I'm going to do, I'm going to do. If I say I won't, I won't. And um, there you go. So it's just there's a little tease for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And I can tell that, uh, you know, your goal was always to learn more and more and to play better every time, as opposed to playing the halftime at Super Bowl at one point or selling a million records. So that fits you for sure. Well, you know, if I could 
broaden my career, I would, but um, I think I'm sort of niched, whereby uh, unless sort of a I'm dragged into the into the limelight, I've sort of carved out a little corner for myself. And while a lot of musicians have come and gone in 40 years, I've always been here. So I guess I'm doing something okay. Um, <laughs> of course you are. I would, huh? Of course you are. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, you know, and I do want to learn because that's my curiosities. I, I like to do things that are new. I already have some ideas for bass, possibly for another record that I believe are completely new, just because my, my imagination functions like this. But I'll tell you quite seriously, if if, if, uh, if I could play the halftime show, you're darn right I'd do it. <laughs> you know, if I could play right. with, with those guys, I would do it in a second. But there's a funny little reputation about me, and it goes like this. I've heard it all my life. And the reputation is, oh, you're so good. You don't want to play with us. <laughs> And I have talked with some of the big name musicians who might feel that my playing in a proper, you know what I mean, a predictable, good bass manner might be a detriment to my own musical uh, cre credo. And it isn't because music is broad. Learning is narrow. T uh, uh, being taught is narrow, as narrow as a straw. But art is as broad as the universe. So... I may or may never get out of this kind of level where I'm at for the rest of my life, but I'm kind of grateful. I, I went to therapy. Mm. I, I had uh, lifelong difficulties um, growing up in a very dysfunctional family. I've been sharing this on most of the interviews I've been uh, doing. And the reason I share it is because maybe people with difficulties will know that therapy can heal. So I got healed greatly. I got into spiritual reading. I, I was the greatest skeptic of everything you could be. And people that know my old posts and know my old attitudes, will it certainly documented the things I've said. Mm -hmm. But many things have changed. So the reason I say this is because I've come to accept everything that is in my life and be grateful for it. I'm really grateful to talk to you. I'm not just giving you lip service. I'm grateful for having this record. I'm grateful for what might come. I'm okay with what might not. It's like a fascinating thing. But my bass playing has never been stronger. I've totally done some new things on the bass that might be, you know, impactful. And at the same time, I love playing whole notes. So I'm not trying to sell myself. I'm a very <laughs> accepting guy of the world. I'm very grateful for everything. That's a good attitude to have, for sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, and and I think, well, you're a bass player nowadays as well. Uh, did you teach anyone the public might be familiar with? And also, what do you look for in a player to take him on board as a, as a student? Well, uh, I've had a few sort of note, noted students. I Maybe the he's not really a student, but I gave him a lesson. Was Gary Sinise the actor? Oh, okay. You know, I gave Getty a lesson once. Uh, gosh, where do I go? A lot of the top bass players in music I've given lessons to. Um, what I do with uh, what I do with students is, and the reason I teach is because I genuinely feel that I don't have any colleagues or support for the narrow approach to teaching. That incidentally, every symphony musician is privy to, and practically every instrument in Western society is taught by, except mm -hmm. the bass, I, I feel. Um, so I think music needs to be championed, so I go it alone. It's a time where students aren't interested, it seems. I'd like to make them interested, because if I give people lessons or teach them how to read a little bit, 20, 30 minutes a day, that's it. After they're done, they go back and they should do the thing they love. They should put their headphones on. They should rock out. They should jam that night in the gig. They should play whatever it is they want. What I teach people replaces nothing. It adds to the quality of their bass playing. And the very cool thing is once it's added, the addition is for life. Bass players have plateaued in their playing many for 20, 30 years. And the young guys are here. They still might find difficulty in their playing. This can easily be fixed, but they have to want to. And that's most important. You have to want to improve. Uh, I, if people want to improve, 
it's an easy job for me. But I got to say, it's probably not going to happen if people attend to groove or feel, because those are the results of having learned how to play. Got it. Got it. Uh, well, Jeff, before I let you go, tell me about your next steps. I mean, I know you're planning shows next year. Uh, any clinics in sight or? You know, it's great you mentioned it. I'm going to go out and do a sort of a one-man clinic tour, which is um, uh, my my agent uh, is putting up a website I'm going to start. And what it is is I'm going to charge people for this. Mm -hmm. And everybody that comes, um, I'm going to give them a, a like, you know, a, a short, an afternoon's period, give or take, of ways to regard the base, fixing problems on the base, how to practice what to practice and i'll tell you what if people do this they're going to get better and this is sort of a one-man operation because i haven't yet found a colleague in the teaching field that might feel as i feel they're they're there but um, um <clears throat> i'm going to do it alone so i'll be advertising a, a, a where whereby i'll be appearing at this store or might be appearing at this school or i might be appearing here or i might be appearing there and it'll be a pay lesson. Um, and the lesson will be offering thoughts for months. That's the idea of a really great lesson. And I want to mm -hmm. have people that don't read. I want to have people that are new to base because they're the ones most going to benefit from it. And people that have difficulties, I can fix them. Because it's such a common, easy thing to do. Yeah. It's really, really yeah. easy to do. If yeah. you know how to uh, get to the source of the difficulty. Very of easy. Yeah. Well, and I can't have you on a call or in an interview and not ask you about Alan Holdsworth because, you know, I know he played with him. I'm a big fan. To me, what he did on guitar was never sur surpassed and never will. Uh, what was it like to play with Alan? Well, pretty much uh, like you described. It's an experience never surpassed and maybe never will. He, Alan was... A self-taught guitarist with a vision, um, and his vision and his creativity and his spirit of experimentation uh, allowed him to become what he became. So when we played, I mean, I I wasn't like him, or you know, I mean, you know, I was a creative guy on the bass, but Alan defined something that is was undefinable he it, it can't be put into words people have imitated him i hear it all the time i think it might be a wise idea not to and pursue <laughs> something that to do what they do you know do you do their own thing do your own thing um yeah being with alan was remarkable P plus we were good friends and we were like two kids together you know we would clown around we called each other daddy hello daddy <laughs> oh daddy smoke screen we call each other smoke screen i call people smoke screen to this day sometimes i don't know what it meant it's just like seeing you and saying hello there uh, okay. uh, uh cabbage you know okay. i don't know hello there uh you know uh, the, the, the tire i don't know whatever. i can't yeah. give an example hi there muskrat how you doing whatever yeah. you know Fair so enough. that's what we did and just being silly you know Musicians are teens, you realize. We're teenagers. When we go on the road, we're like kids that are going, wee, we're not around mommy and daddy now. We can get silly. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, that's a great quote for the interview, if, if I'm allowed to use that one. So. <laughs> you can use anything that you want. That's awesome. the joy, one of the joys of touring. Scott yeah. Henderson and I, Scott Henderson and I looked for ways to, to say something that the other guy didn't say like i can't even repeat our jokes <laughs> but i really can't but but if we got to the extremity of of really crazy thought and insane sexual innuendo <laughs> and just unrealistic whatever we would then try to find something worse you know right so we were like and we did this into our 60s so it's like we were like kids, you know, on going to summer camp. We just got crazy. We, you know, and I've done this with a lot of guys. And it was, I mean, we're mature adults at, at, at the times when it was required. But when you're spending, you know, hours a day with other men, you, you, you often 
get into silly you know what it's like you've been on the road so you know it is. Oh, of course yeah well i have a day job that requires me to travel so and i'm always looking for excuses to get out of the house for sure i can <laughs> totally relate <laughs> yeah uh and jeff to finish off tell me about your next steps i know you're planning some shows next year uh and any base clinics in sight yeah, I'm going to tour the Jack Band next year as best. Uh, I already have a group. It includes mm -hmm. John McCracken, the record producer. So we talked about that. It's sort of a little bit like Felix Papillardi as the cream producer playing bass in Mountain, you know, <laughs> doing theme from an imaginary western. I think it was Mountain's biggest uh, hit, except maybe for Mississippi Queen. And uh, John McCracken is guitar playing, uh, playing guitar, guitar, he's a guitar player. Yeah. On uh, in this band, and uh, every musician in in the group ha played on the record in some form or other. It's going to be rocking. So uh, those okay. are my two plans. Plus, I have two records in the can already. Oh, okay, okay, two done records, but uh, I'm going to wait a while. I'm okay, wait a while. Yeah. Pace I have good records yeah. to to, pro yeah. to promote. Yeah. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for, in, for the interview. I hope your tour makes it to Toronto. I'd be glad to see you live. Uh, and all the best with Jack songs and the future plans. Well, thank you very kindly, Rodrigo. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So uh, I guess we'll say our goodbyes, and I hope I see you soon. Absolutely. Take care. Thanks. Thank Bye. you, sir. Bye. Bye-bye.